Voilà, bonsoir. Bienvenue à cette rencontre autour de l'architecture. Comme vous le savez, euh, l'architecture la, la, suisse est très connue à travers le monde. On a déjà eu euh, à Suisse Met Culture deux grands architectes qui sont venus nous parler. L'année dernière, Mario Botta et il y a trois ans, Santiago Calatrava. Et ce soir, c'est le tour de Stéphane Marbach de la maison euh, Herzog de Meuron. Herzog de Meuron est un des cabinets d'architecture les plus, les plus connus du, de Suisse et, et du monde, fondé en 1978 par Jacques Herzog et Pierre de Meuron. En 2001, ils ont reçu le prix Pritzker, qui est le, plus, le prix le plus fameux du monde dans le domaine de l'architecture, et leur, euh, leur réalisation ne se compte plus à travers le monde depuis euh, le fameux Bird Nest de, de, de Pékin, en passant par la tête moderne, euh, en passant par la Elbe Symphonie, des bâtiments, des, euh, des salles de concert, des musées. Le, le monde entier euh, connaît Herzog, Herzog de Meuron. Et ce soir, Stéphane Marbach va nous parler des liens entre son travail et la, la durabilité. Stéphane Marbach est l'un des senior partners de Herzog de Meuron. Moi, j'ai eu la chance de faire sa connaissance quand j'étais au Liban, où il a réalisé une, un bâtiment qui s'appelle Beirut, qui était un, vraiment un bâtiment assez extraordinaire, toute une série de, de un gratte-ciel fait de, fait, fait de terrasses. Il a aussi à, à Bâle, quand vous allez à Art Basel, cette fameuse Messe Basel, l'entrée de, de Art Basel, euh, le nouveau stade de, de, de Bordeaux, le magasin Prada à Tokyo et pas mal d'autres réalisations. Merci et bonne soirée. Merci. Merci, Monsieur Paras. Euh, merci pour m'inviter. Euh, mais je vais parler en anglais maintenant. Je suis désolé de ça, mais ça prendrait trop long de présenter ça en français pour moi. So, I prepared the presentation. I hope it's not going to take too long. It's and um, it's a bit technical. I didn't know that so many famous architects came before and talked about the beautiful buildings. So I put the focus a bit uh, on a different topic, on the topic of uh, sustainability, because it's a, a topic that concerns probably all of us. And also in our office, we started to think really um, a lot about that, how we can tackle that, how would that influence our architecture in the future. Um, yeah, you know, we are based in Basel. Our office is about 600 people. So it's um, a big Swiss company, actually. Um, we have subsidiaries, as you can see, in different parts of the world. And uh, we are working at the same time on about uh, 90 projects. So they are a bit all over the world. Actually, also, I wanted to present some of our Russian projects today, but I changed this morning, I deleted them. Um, yeah, it's very sad, <laughs> this in incident, but um, hopefully, yeah, this will uh, get better again. We have, as an architect office, not really a style as many other architects, if you think of Sahadit or uh, Mario Botta, they have a clear identity, a clear style of architecture. In our architecture, is very different, very specific, always to where we build. Eh? So it's very difficult to recognize a Herzog de Moron building immediately, maybe. We work on different scales. So we do f single family houses, but not very ma many. Um, but we do also like stadiums, hospitals, and also large scale city planning. We give every project a number. That's why you, you might notice when I go through the project, they have numbers. It's because we started to number them. Meanwhile, we have arrived at number 600. Uh, when I started, we were at number 40. So these are the, the three main topics I'm going to talk about. Um, our approach to the sustainability, a comprehensive and interdisciplinary approach. Then about adaptive reuse. Reuse is a big topic in architecture. Transformation and uh, conservation. And finally about materials. 
and circular economy. So a comprehensive and inter interdisciplinary approach. This is a sketch by Pierre who that shows a bit um, you know, how we approach things. Architecture is never done solely by an architect who has a brilliant idea and he just is going to be realized. It's always kind of a, a teamwork and many stakeholders are involved. So you have, it's, it looks a bit chaotic, <laughs> but <laughs> it should show that, um, you know, you should think things together holistically. Um, good architecture always needs a good client, a smart client to be uh, realized successfully. That's a very important topic. And um, a clear way of thinking and structure the process. That's mainly very important when you do large scale city uh, projects, where it's a lot about politics, about money, um, to enable these big projects. You need to bring many people at the same table, eh? at the table. And I think quite successfully we started to think not only about architecture when we do city planning, it's also about the non-built space. Um, same important as really the built space, that you care about the landscape, that you take care of the landscape, that you don't build everywhere in Switzerland. It's a, it's a very important topic that also it's thought together with infrastructure. So infrastructure, landscape and settlement is somehow one thing you should think about at the same time. You cannot separate that. City planning should not be just in the hand of technocrats or in the hand of architects. So it's really this inter interdisciplinary approach that is uh, key. Here an example, that's a, a study we did in Dreispitz in Basel. This is the Basel area with the Basel city in the center and the arms that go out into uh, part of France, Germany and Basel Land. This is this part which is called uh, Dreispitz, which was a formal um, basically non-accessible area in the city where they stored, it was just for transportation and logistics. So it was closed and the transformation started about 10 years ago. Already then we did the study and now we followed up that study. Um, understanding first what is there, what can be kept is very important. Um, there is lots of quality there, but also I we realize that this is the hottest place in, s in Basel. In the summer it goes up the temperature to 40 degrees and it's the problem is there is only asphalt, there is no green space. And the, winds, the wind are blocked by the buildings. So that's an is uh, aspect that's going to concern us all in the future, that our cities um, you know, that are comfortable to live, that we make them more green and uh, more attractive also to public space. So that is the aim. We want to go from here basically to there. Um, to have um, a mixture of building typologies. So we have like this, like mushrooms, the high rise uh, grow up. They're very slender uh, towers. Um, so it's a mix of different building typologies. And then it's always about this duality of creating more value, um, more open space for all, also more value for the developers. So it has to be also economically attractive for a developer to invest money there um, and to pay you know, for all this public space that costs also money. So it is kind of this, um, on one hand, you want to densify a city, which is important that we you know, find ways to live closer together, but also to pay attention on the quality of public space. So that is the studies nowadays. You can do all these amazing simulations to understand what the impact is on the temperature. If you change, if you bring it more green, if you, um, you know, build, for example, high rise, or s slim towers, because they bring down the, the cool winds from top and the hot air is, gr is rising up on around them. At the same time, you can understand which buildings currently they are there that are blocking the wind and what the impact is if you remove them. So all these studies have been done. So it's again, 
it's not only an architect doing this w kind of planning. It's a uh, it's a uh, many different engineers are involved, especially also, um, you know, politicians are at the table, developers are at the table, and of course the landowner. So it has to work somehow for all of them to to have a chance to be realized. In the north of this area, so it's it's very up here in, in the peak of this triangle, it's the Dreispitz North area. It's a place that belongs to Migro and the CMS, which is a foundation. This is the current situation there. It's at the end of the Gundeldinger Quartier. And there's a Migro, like we know, we all know it. And uh, the plan is now again there, there was a competition to develop that area, to densify it. You see it's going to be densified a lot. It's it has a FAR, what we call it, by seven, or so seven times the plot area is built in area. Um, and that goes together with improvement of the public space. So it's really the idea of connecting that new part of the city with the old part and to provide this green space for everyone. And on top of that, you see that shed building, that's going to be a school. So it's a school on top of a parking. So it's also about thinking new typologies um, in, in, a, in a new city so that you mix, you don't segregate anymore like in the modern times that you live at one place and you work like far apart and you have to commute long ways. It's the idea to bring or to mix different functions again together. That is uh, basically shown here, mix it the usage eh? um, yeah it's about these numbers also how much green space you bring into the city mm -hmm. and how you connect that green space you know with the parking below which will remain uh, with a public space on top so it's kind of a funny uh, project, but it's going to be a reality. So this is all these renderings you do nowadays to show what the build, uh, build, uh, place is going to look like. Um, another project I talk in this same um, basically situation is a project Mr. Boris mentioned is a Prada Oyama project I worked on like 20 years ago as a, as a young architect. Uh, was of course a fantastic time, beginning of 2000. Many things were possible. We were experimenting a lot in the office, a lot with models still working, not so much with uh, digital technologies, but a lot with physical models. And um, so it is again this kind of interdisciplinary approach. In this project, we really try to bring, like in times when you build a Gothic cathedral, space, facade, um, structure and ornament together. It's a very unified approach, which is, uh, we tried here, yeah. yeah. So this is the, there was the existing building, which started with a sketch, with the idea of building a house and a plaza, because a, pr a public space is something we hardly find in Japan. The Japanese people also don't use the public space so excessively, like they do in China, for example. Then we looked at the zoning guideline, how much you can build, what um, zoning guidelines you need to respect. That was the starting point. Then there was all this model making like an architect like to do. Um, the idea of, because it is a shop, Prada, a nice brand that puts the product into the focus. And so we played a lot with perception with bending the glass of the facade inside, so you need to you have the feeling you just immediately can grab this, uh, the products, or bending the glass outside so you can look into the city. So there was a conceptual model we built then that illustrates a bit this idea. That was uh, the reality of the shop windows that um, you know, allows you to look inside without a reflection. These were the idea of focusing in some areas, fuse outside to the city. That's a plan of, um, of the facade 
that shows where we have um, concave and convex glazing. We brought that then together with a structural LID so that the facade is getting a structural element. Um, so that was uh, the sketch of the structural engineer, so different forces that go down. And always when you create a triangle, it's very ideal for earthquake, which is a big topic in Japan, obviously. Mm. Um, so we then exploded the core. Instead of having one fat single core, we had this multiple cores layout, so a kind of very transparent fluent space. So when you're inside that shop, you have always the feeling th the space is continuing on the side. And uh, you see that in that model. And then we introduce a different type of space, this more intimate space in these tube-like spaces where the changing rooms are. They're built in steel, like it's typically done in Japan, like in uh, like submarine structure. So they also brace the building from one side to the other. And they built that with uh, extremely precision. When we talk about Swissness and how precise we are, um, there's still things to learn for us from the Japanese, maybe. Um, and it's a good combination with Prada as an Italian client, I have to say. <laughs> So we had then played with the materiality of soft materials like carpets and silicon or leather compared to the more uh, rough, simple materials on the outside. So maybe if you go to visit, meanwhile there is a second building next door of it is uh, Miu Miu, the small um, sister brand of Mucha Brada. We built a second shop over there, which has a t totally different approach. This one is all about transparency that you can look inside and the other is more like a jewel box that is hiding everything inside. So yeah, that is more it, the idea of transparency. And still, it's 20 years old, it feels very fresh, I think, when you go there. That's also something which makes, I think, a project sustainable, that it lasts long because people care of it. Um, so we should never forget all this talk about sustainability, also the beauty. <coughs> to make something beautiful is also important. If we do s sustainable architecture but it's ugly, it's also not so sustainable <laughs> in the long term. <laughs> so that's what it looks at night. Adaptive reuse, um, important topic in architecture today. This is a project I worked on the uh, same time as we did the Prada building. It's in Spain, in Madrid. It's in um, the Paseo Prado. With the on one side you have the park, on the other side is this main avenue. Where there was, this is the street, you see, on one side. And there was a, a petrol station. And in the back of it was uh, an old power station, like the same situation we found later also in the Tate. Um, uh, interesting ab abandoned space. Um, and then it was the idea to lift the building, basically. So we took away <coughs> the plinths and extended the public space. Because when we went there, there was no space in front and it was really um, congested. So we want to extend the public space below the building. You can see, so it's really lifting. And um, when you go to visit the museum, you uh, approach the building from below. You see here, there we then also had a collaboration with Patrick Blanc, the landscape architect, to make that facade on the one side super green. And it's a very nice contrast to the red of the brick as a co uh, complementary color. Um, so that's how you approach the building from below. And then you find this, I think, very nice stair that welcomes you and brings you up to the exhibition space. Also, stairs are a very important element in architecture um, because it should motivate people to use the stair and not just be uh, an egress stair. A stair can be a very nice experience also, of course. And the exhibition space. Meanwhile, we did uh, we built many museums worldwide. Um, of course, the aim is always to have the art in the center and to have the architecture not too important. 
when you do exhibition space. That's uh, like from outside the green wall of Patrick Blanc and the red of the brick plus the extension in this uh, corrugated metal on top. Um, another project we recently completed, just uh, actually a, a year and a half ago. I could not go and visit myself because it was during the corona time. Um, it's in Tokyo in Ginza, so a very busy area. Um, and Uniqlo occupied one floor on the top. They're just tenants, so we could not really touch the building a lot from the outside, um, which is we have to work inside. And often the reaction of an architect is, let's take it down. It's not a very nice building. And we build something new, something great. Um, but this way, I think we looked for a modest approach, very humble approach, maybe also kind of a Swiss approach, <laughs> to um, not to be too loud and to first understand what the potential of the existing structure is. Um, and then we simply opened up as much of the building on the ground floor and exposed the structure. So we like ripped things away. It's a kind of a subtractive approach to architecture, taking things away which are not necessary. All the suspended ceiling we took away, we reorganized the uh, MEP. We cut out, you see here on the image, cut out um, slabs and open up a big void in the center. We had to keep the beams and the columns because of um, earthquake, but actually it's, it's quite nice. It gives this kind of uh, feeling of nearly an endless space. We introduced mirror in the ceiling, so it really um, emphasized this effect of uh, having an endless big space. And that's kind of the centerpiece, and the shop is then uh, organized around that. So it opens up visual links from, sh from floor to floor, and you understand as a customer when you come in that you can find more things on top. Yeah. And as you know, Uniqlo is led by the CEO, Mr. Yonai, who I met a few times. He is the richest Japanese but he cares about the money a lot. He comes from an area in Japan where they really don't want to spend a lot. And this was also a good experience, I think, to, um, to have a tight budget and to look after every uh, yen. We had to be careful in spending it. Um, so the, the, uh, the whole approach to this project was kind of modest and simple. And one special if element we introduced are these lanterns. These are these cubes outside which turn around and have a quite a nice effect at night. Also one of them on top of the building. And then, uh, now finally the, the last one is materials and the circular economy. We saw it last year that the world is changing. We have, um, it's not just an abstract thing. The the rising temperatures uh, caused lots of um, issues. Same, t same year we had the fire, we had um, um, land degradation, uh, loss of bio biodiversity. Um, you, you know all these things, yes. And this is due mainly to rising temperatures. So if we just keep on doing what we do, how we live, then temperature will go up by about four degrees. Um, if we, if, we, if we would do nothing, it would go up by four degrees, sorry. If we follow the current policies, it would go up by about th three p um, degrees, which is a lot. Um, and the aim is, your, you know, to go down by one and a half or two p degree maximum. So that really um, calls for big actions. And also it concerns the building sector. The building sector is uh, the emissions of um, CO2 is about 40%. 28% globally speaking, 28% is in the operational and 11% uh, in the construction business. So it is time for action. Um, we then also developed this kind of circle for us, how we want to approach 
um, sustainability. It has many different aspects, obviously. It is not just about the materiality, it's also about uh, social elements, it's about um, econo economical elements. Um, so that is illustrating in that circle. But materiality is obviously an important part of this, but not the only one. Uh, so one of the projects we did um, five years ago, I worked on that, is in for Ricola. Ricola is one of our long-lasting clients. We did already seven projects with them. This one is a um, Kräuterzentrum, um, where they dry uh, the herbs. They From them, they make their candies. So and there we used really the excavation material. You can see here. Um, that's the where we took the material from. It all comes around from 10 kilometers close to the building. We, o we also used the uh, excavation material itself. We brought that to an empty, um, basically, space we found just in Zwingen, the next village. It was all arranged there, separated. It's like when you do cooking, you have to make the mise en place, and when you work with rammed earth, you do it exactly the same way. So you have the different types of soil, uh, different types of aggregate. You have to make tests to understand what the quality is, what the right mixture is. You do pressure tests um, like that, these cubes you can see here. Then you have to mix it together. It's not so complicated. You press it to the foam work, and uh, so you put these elements out like big Lego bricks. And then you need to to dry them for about three months. They have to lose the water. <coughs> they shrink a bit. And then they are ready to bring to be brought on site. Of course, you could also do it on site. You can ram the earth on site. But you can't do that during the cold times. So then it would take very long to build such a building. That's why we went for this kind of prefabrication methods we did developed here with Martin Rauch. So this e every element was shipped on site, um, brought on place, and then you simply um, yeah, put the soil in between, and in the end you have a very erratic piece of earth. So you can't anymore see the single elements, it becomes one big piece. It's kind of beautiful because it has the same color as uh, the surrounding um, soil. We then cut in also a window which we make like in a cathedral. We made it round because also um, if you have a, a horizontal bar, you need to do that in concrete. Or, But if you do it round, you can do it in the soil with the, with the rammed earth itself because the force go around like that. You need to have these um, basically barriers in. This is Kalkdross, lime, a little bit of lime, that is stopping or slowing down the erosion process. The wall itself is about 45 centimeters thick, but it's during the first five years, you might lose the first two centimeters on the west part of the facade. On the south, it remains like new, but in the west side, you can see the rain hits it and you lose about ten cent two, 2 centimeters, but you still have 43 centimeters. So it's going to last forever, but once you don't use it anymore, the material, it goes back to and be just soil. Or it's very simple to, to be reused also. Yeah, so that's uh, the building itself, how it sits in the landscape, the space inside. It's also not climate control on the inside. The thick walls also naturally provide the climate control you need in summer and winter for the herbs. And it integrates itself very nicely, I think, in the landscape as an element. The second project I show you is kind of a, a case study. It's a very new project we've been working on the last year. Um, it's in Alschwil, close to Basel. It's a, a village on the front to Frontier de, uh, de uh, France, at the border to France, exactly. Sorry. It's one of the 
Basel, as you know, is a life science cluster. We have we have Roche, one of our most important clients. We have Novartis, we have the university, and we have smaller startups. And one of these clusters been built uh, the last 10 years in Alsfield, that's um, down here, where you find uh, Octelion, for example, you might know. There's also a client of us that was then sold to Johnson Johnson recently and is now uh, called Idorsia, but other new companies too. And um, so this area has been developed. On the north of it, this is what's called Basel Link. This is where um, new buildings are built. We have um, one on the construction too. And the one you see here in black is what we call the Hortus. That's an office building. Others that we build around are lab buildings. And the lab buildings naturally need to build in concrete. It's very difficult to build lab not in concrete because of the vibration. We have actually a follow-up project where we now try to challenge that. But um, concrete has a lot of advantages too. And <coughs> it's not a material from the past. It will also for, for sure have a future. Um, but we need to be more cautious using concrete because about 8% of um, of our CO2 emission is in concrete in Switzerland. So concrete is, uh, is an issue. We should use less cement. We sh when we use concrete, we should maybe again build, as we did in the past, with thinner concrete slabs, pay more on labor work, but uh, and uh, reduce the material. Materials is just too cheap at the moment in Switzerland. So we don't care, we use a lot of material. We rather make a slab 30 centimeters thick than really calculate it carefully, the, the minimal dimensions. Mm -hmm. So here the aim was to make a building without any uh, concrete. And that's our client, Johannes. His mission was to make a building which is basically paying back in 30 years all the energy it used to build it. So after one generation, it is uh, an energy positive building. So we focus, when you see again our circle of um, aspects that are important in sustainability, we fo more focused on the, um, the ecological part, also of treibhouse gas, CO2 emissions, the energy and the materials. We change the way we work. Normally, as an architect, you start with a concept, with brilliant ideas. You study the site, the program that the client gives you. Here, we <coughs> had first this Nachhaltigkeitsziel, also the, the, the goals in terms of sustainability that the client wanted to achieve. And from that, we developed the single building elements. First, we developed um, a slab. A also instead of a concrete slab, which we, u we normally, the most of the Gray energy, the CO2 emission, is in the, in the structure, mainly in the, in the slabs of a building. That's why we first started with that element. And out of that building element, we basically developed then the project. Um, we took unusually long time to start the project with a bigger team, so it's also a bigger financial investment of a client with a lot of different specialists involved in the first phase of a project. So the goals, yeah, don't go through all of them, um, but the, as I said, the focus was on the building ecology, on these parts. Um, yeah, now I some details I hope don't annoy you too much with that. It's um, first part was energy. We looked at reducing energy. Still in Switzerland, we want to go away from nuclear energy and fossil energy. So we need to in find way where to place our solar panels and the renewable energy. So energy consumption in Switzerland is 45% is in building sector. We want to go, you know, energy efficiency pass to this so-called 2,000 watt Gesellschaft. As a comparison, currently we use more than double, 5,500 watt uh, per head. Uh, compared to the USA, they still use the double. But we want to go down to 2,000, so it's a substantial step 
reduction of, uh, of our energy consumption. Energy consumption in the building sector has basically two elements. The embodied energy, also the energy you use to build to for the construction, and then the energy for the operation of a building, to heat the building, to cool the building, the electricity you use. These are the two aspects. Um, uh, the embodied energy, also the, build the energy we use for the construction, when you do a very sustainable building, the aim is to go to 40, and our aim was to go basically half of it. We only use half of that energy to build it, than a normal building, grey energy. Then the renewable, uh, the operational energy, uh, here you talk about non-renewable and renewable energy. Um, when you just look at um, the non-renewable, we use zero. So there's no fossil energy in the building. Hmm? And in we have all the solar panels, we have the, um, the, the heat pumps, we use the, um, the earth, the, the temperature in earth, to heat and cool the building. But we produce more energy than we need. And with this plus energy, basically we can pay back the energy over 30 years. So you can see on top, that's normally how um, a project starts with the double of the energy you use than we use to build a building. And then every year you use energy for the electrical supply, for heating, cooling the building. So the, it, the energy demand goes up and up. And in our case, because of the plus energy we produce, it goes down. Um, the other aspect is the climate, also the carbon footprint the building has, the CO2 emissions. In Switzerland, 25% of the, our CO2 emissions come from the building sector. You remember f worldwide is 40, in Switzerland it is uh, 24%. Also here, there is a path, uh, an aim to reduce um, the CO2 emissions. Currently, we have five tons per, per, uh, per capita and year. And the, uh, the aim is to go down by five times, five times less. Again, the USA, as you see, a comparison is 17 tons, China 10 tons, but they're catching up. Um, so again, when you talk about carbon, there's these two elements, the construction and then the operational. In the construction, you can't build a building without CO2 emissions. That is just not possible. Because you need transport, all the materials have a CO2 footprint. You can just try to reduce that as much as possible. But you can't do a CO2 neutral building in a construction. Even if you read that sometimes, this is just not possible. Huh? Um, so the aim was to have nine kilograms uh, CO2 per, per square meter and year, we managed to go down to 4.4 kilograms. Um, so this is all this lady uh, that dictates you or tells you what, in terms of operation, how much CO2 you can em emit uh, per year. So in a Minergy, you might know that uh, label or uh, SNBS Platinum, is still a, an emission, but uh, in our case we have uh, zero emissions. That's possible, of course. So how do we achieve that? Um, so no fossil energy, heating, cooling through ge geothermal energy. So we have these heat pumps. We have um, electricity is all produced by solar panels. Um, so we had to activate the facade and the roof. We're still discussing um, now with the Bauinspektorat, the building authorities, if that is possible. Because also that's a, a key point. If you uh, invest in new technology, also the authorities need to change and reconsider, challenge some of their uh, regulations. We have uh, natural ventilation. 
We have in the mid um, a natural pond. We so collect the rainwater and create a microclimate. And finally, we have a resulting CO2 emissions in the construction of 4,200 tons. So how could we um, basically compensate for that? We were thinking of th different methods. Probably we're going to uh, plant trees. The client will um, try to plant as many trees needed to compensate for uh, the CO2 emissions that are caused by the construction of the building. And that's a lot, that's many trees. It's more than 5,000 trees you would have to build, plan for this building. Yeah. If you calculate it in 70 years, if you look in a longer distance, maybe the tree will last uh, 300 years, then you have to build much less. But if you calculate it for 70 years, it would be then 5,000 trees. It's a lot. Um, and finally, it is the material itself to have the circular industry. So we don't use any cement, no concrete, uh, no um, plasterboards, so no um, gips, uh, no gypsum, no plastic, no adhesive, no metal, nearly no metal. Uh, and using a lot of local materials. So focus was on renewable materials, reversible materials, recycled materials, etc. That's what the project looks like a bit. It's a bit alternative. <coughs> We developed a new um, building technology, first time used in this building. So we use uh, timber, but raw timber mainly. Only the primary bees are engineered timbers. Then we have used again the rammed the earth, the soil basically directly from the excavation. We use paper for insulation, 40 centimeters, or straw on the roof. We evaluate it like you have to do each of single material. You need to evaluate which has the bigger impact on, on uh, CO2 emissions or gray energy. And like that, we evaluate the best basically mixture of materials to reduce uh, this project uh, elevations. Important is also the windows and the solid part, as little windows as possible, because the window also has a lot of gray energy in it. Um, of course, not too little, because you also need daylight in it. Um, but we also changed from triple glazing to double glazing, because double glazing has much less gray energy in than triple glazing. So everything was just really put on the extreme and try to be opt optimal in terms of gray energy omissions. It's a question if this still makes fun to make architecture <laughs> like that. Um, it's certainly a challenge. So we looked at uh, um, the PV panels are produced in Switzerland, um, locally, the steel staircase. We use a lot of reused material that was from another place where it is uh, demolished. We bring that to our site, for example, all the floor materials. Um, finally, it's also the ideal structure where you p place the, the, the is is egress staircase, etc. We have no basement because again that has a lot of CO2. We lifted the building from the ground to have um, cool air that is under the building to use that for ventilate the building. Then we developed a special floor slab. Of course this needs to comply with all the building regulations. We evaluated really different types of slabs. On the left you see um, a, co a concrete slab and we compared it always in terms of, on the left, in terms of construction cost per square meter, in terms of CO2 emission and grey energy. And finally we developed a, <coughs> a slab that has 10 times less CO2 emissions. It's, um, raw timber and rammed earth construction. It's like a stick system, so it can be very quickly assembled together. We used, for the mock-up test, actually we used an, a mock-up uh, piece of material he still had in his um, construction, in his, sorry, in his, uh, at his place for the Ricola building that he built five years ago. And you can s just simply smash it and reuse it for a new building material. 
So he made again test, different tests we did, and then we had this idea of basically make this foam work, which you finally also going to use. Um, turn it 180 degrees around, put the soil in it, and uh, ram it. Hmm? Now this is done ma naturally, uh, manually, but we also tested that with bigger robots. That's um, the result we had. Basically, it's probably a one year ago we arrived here, and then we put it on fire. So we had to burn it to show, demonstrate that it complies with the fire regulation. It has to resist um, um, 30 minutes. Uh, no, sorry, 60 minutes to the fire. Huh? So. We had approved this uh, ERI 16, so 60 minutes resisting the fire and smoke. And this is now test we're doing in the ETH and also applying new computer robot technology to quicker um, produce everything. Um, yes, so now we basically um, have appointed one big company. The interest of the building industry was big. This is something very positive, I have to say, in Switzerland. All the building industry understands that they need to change something and um, invest in new technologies. So that's kind of really great. Also, I think Switzerland is still has this innovative power that you don't need to comply 100% with something. You don't need to license the projects through a very complicated process. You just can demonstrate that you comply through tests like that with current regulations, and then you, you can use it to build it. Much simpler than in France. So, which is not a surprise. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so that um, the structure we developed is basically every 280, you have a column by 560. 560 is the distance you can span with a natural timber without laminated or um, the timber. That's the space. So it's a pure um, timber structure. Also, the, the whole stiffening you need for a building for in terms of earthquake is done with not with concrete cores, it's done with um, timber. Yes. So these are the cores, but they are um, no non-structural in them. It's in that sense, what we placed it exactly there where you don't have a lot of daylight. So also with these new computer simulations, you can really make a building very smart in that sense. You can also, again, as I said, optimize the position of the PV panels, the inclination of PV panels. Um, same process as we did with the uh, slabs, we did with the facade, understanding which element is using minimum CO2 emissions developed then this facade <coughs> with um, yeah, openable windows, simple swinging windows, PV elements, white um, blinds on the outside, um, optimize really the height of the solid part of the balustrade, optimize the part of the window. We then developed the roof, different types of roof we tested in terms of en efficiency, in terms of um, energy production. Finally, a simple roof we use with very standard panels because it's also about cost. If you want to go and make this a market solution, we also have to pay attention on cost. Um, it doesn't help if it's an eco ecological building, but it can't be recopied. If nobody else can afford it, it's, it should be really a technology that is basically can compete in the future with the concrete building. Currently it's about 20% what the cost we get in. It's about 20% more expensive than a kind of a generic office building. So it's not the double, it's 20%. Yeah. But our client believes also there is, a, in long terms, it's interesting for tenants and for him as an investor, he's going to keep the building because there should be less um, maintenance cost. And especially in the energy, you produce all the energy you use in the building itself already. So another aspect is that the biodiversity, 
the whole area here in the center is car free. We have some um, main um, parking spaces for the car above ground. And it has this connecting green uh, park in the center of it. We also have a green part in our building. That's the garden, the Hortus, as the name says. That's the center of the building where we collect the rainwater and have developed different um, plant, or selected different species for um, achieving the greatest possible biodiversity in terms of plants and uh, wildlife, insects, birds, etc. Again, that is very scientific approach done by um, a group of um, women from Zurich that help us really selecting um, the right species of it. And this idea of collecting the water. And, and in the end also creating, that's our job as architects, nice spaces for the people. Attractive program, also program that is activating the place around it, that gives something to the community, like a nice cafe, restaurant, a shop, and also outdoor areas where are that are nice in terms of for people to use, to hang out. That's how you approach the building. So you from outside, you go inside first into that courtyard. And from there, you go then inside the building. So the Hortus, that's really the, the heart of the building. That's why we gave it the name Hortus. And so it should be finished in about two years from now. I hope um, our client keeps the energy to bring that through because it's not so easy. If you change something so radically, you need to have a lot of discussions with the building industry, which, as, as I said, is very open for this change, but also with the authorities. Yeah. So that's the building, what the quarters looks inside. Merci. <laughs> <laughs> Can you can you tell us a little more about the the Paris project, which is not a project anymore, because I think the building is going to start in the 15th district, like now. Uh, triangle. La, yeah, le triangle. Um, you didn't see any photographs or uh, very short photographs you showed us. You uh, don't yeah, have unfortunately, any? No, no photographs. So is on it, it the same the same the same idea with sustainable? Uh, or, or not? Okay. No, no, <laughs> no, no. You know, architecture is a business that takes long time. The triangle we started to think of ten years ago, and frankly, ten years ago we didn't uh, thought about sustainability in the same way. So there's a discussion in the French press about that project too, because obviously already the shape of it has a lot of surface. And uh, we comply with all the regulations in terms of French regulations. Try to reduce the, the glazing as much as possible. Also to have solid parts in the balustrade and not full height glazing. But still there's a lot of glass in it. But still um, we believe it is a very interesting project for the area. Um, certainly a very iconic project uh, with a beautiful shape that looks very different from every angle you look at it. And it also has this idea which we have in many of our projects to introduce a civic space. So you build a big building, a high building, very visible building for a private developer, but you have, you include a public space in it, a, a place where everybody can go. Um, and that's the case too in uh, La Triangle. Uh, to, to get back to your Otis project, which I think is fantastic, uh, the many experiences that I've heard of are that it's very, very costly to maintain, especially those, you know, and, and if it's not maintained properly, you know, it's kind of, the, the, all the green aspects becomes, uh, be, and uh, have you thought about this, and what kind of extra cost you think you have in maintaining that kind of a building? Um, yes, yes. We all know that if you have a private garden, <laughs> how much work it takes. And um, well, we, the, the specialists try to consider as much the, the, cor the local conditions in terms of sun and uh, shadow that are very key for um, the soil aspect of to, to um, 
pick to select the right species. That's, I think, key. But still, it, there is maintenance, and the project, the garden will look very different in winter times than in summer. And um, yeah, the, the maintenance of it is important, but in this case, the, the developer, Sen Immobilien from St. Gallen, is also keeping the building. So they will uh, rent it out, they will make sure the building looks nice in the future too. <laughs> How you convince your clients to do uh, uh, sustainable buildings? Um, well, in this case, the client convinced us. <laughs> 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 but um, yes, also, it's very different, different where, where you build. We have, like, as I said, in the beginning, we have projects everywhere on the world nearly. And um, the way of thinking about sustainability is very different in the US or also regulations are very different than in Switzerland. Also in France it's different from Germany or many projects, as I said, about 8% of our turnover we did so far in, in Russia, which might change now drastically, quickly. Um, there all, again, you have a different way of thinking about sustainability. But the interest, and we have a good position, we can carefully select our client to look for common interest to make also in a developer project, uh, as I said already, some improvement in for the public realm for everybody. But important to us is of course also to have the right mixity of project, to have public project, private projects, to have um, office building but also museum building and to work on different places on the world. We still believe in time to kind of international globalization but maybe it's going to be different now. I don't want to talk about politics now. So the boss could do that better. <laughs> but as, a, as an architecture office who was really part of this development in the last year, like I worked myself in, as you could see, in uh, some international project, like in Japan, from there I went to work for China for this uh, stadium, Birdness Stadium. And at that time, we always believed things are going to be, become better. Or <laughs> They're going to change to the bed, to the bed. Um, and it was amazing to work there. And I hope still, I think we can all do that, to work in different places, because it is so enriching for our minds. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm not familiar with architecture, but I learned a lot. So <laughs> thank you so much. I was wondering about the core values of uh, Herzog et de Meuron. Because it seems that all the buildings you showed us and all what you explained is very aligned uh, with the core values like uh, yeah, sustainability is one of them, of course. But are there some others which you could mention? Excuse me? Values like oh. respect for nature, of course, I guess. And and I, I don't know if you are... If you are um, Following the rules of Feng Shui, for instance, because I, I, I feel there is a big Japanese influence in your buildings, and uh, I was wondering if you, yeah, if you have been working on values for the for the company around those things. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, also we are all fascinated by traditional architecture. You can learn so much in traditional architecture especially also many famous architects like Frank Lloyd Wright and so we're always fascinated by Japanese architecture, special, right? Also Chinese architecture, traditional Chinese architecture is the Feng Shui. Also in India they have uh, something similar like Feng Shui. So also in Switzerland you can see so many interesting traditional architecture. It's incredible how diverse architecture was when you look at um, vernacular architecture. You can, when you go to Ballenberg, you know, you might know Ballenberg is a Freilichtmuseum. Um, you can immediately tell when you look at the building in what climate zones in Switzerland it comes from. A building from Ticino looks different from Graubünden. Or, and if you look at nowadays prefabricated houses, whether they are in Japan or in the US, they look the same. I, I go every year to Japan and, as I said, I'm very fascinated by traditional architecture, but not by contemporary so much. 
They have these plastic facades. If you turn off the air conditioning, within 10 minutes you can't really live anymore there. And if you look at how smart the traditional architecture was with these different layers, that makes it very nice for, it, for humans simply to live there because you have this constantly draft that you can control. So in one way, I think we need to go back, build more locally, more specific to a place, same time applying new technology. Sir, I have the feeling that the Swiss architect have a specialty. It's including technicality in all their buildings. Is this one of the characteristics of the Swiss architecture? And even maybe because most of the architects are studied at the technical school. Um, yes, I think so. M myself, I was first a draftsman before I studied architecture. And I think still the level of craftsmanship in Switzerland is good. A lot of people ho still make apprenticeship and learn really technically how to build a building. And that's the base for a good architecture. You can't do nice detailing without good craftsmanship. In Japan you still have them, but there's also it getting more, di more and more difficult to find them. We have a question here. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting presentation, in particular for the uh, Hortus project. I wanted to know from this particular expertise if you can already today uh, have some taybacks and consider that integrating sustainability is actually a plus, an asset for better architecture, or if you really had to go through a lot of constraints. Today, do you think it's really an asset, or is it more a constraint? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> I was also a bit struggling because it limits a bit your abilities. You is somehow you can't do everything, obviously. Um, so it's a bit not only frustrating, but you have to learn to find a new freedom to work with this possibility within these possibilities. Difficult. To explain, you have more constraints, so you can't do everything. Not just everything is possible. Um, you have to make it somehow in a smart way. But I see also a lot of chance opportunities to work closer together with the building industry again, you know, to develop new ways of making a building, and a closer bond between architects, engineers, and the building industry, which can open up new windows. So uh, there is certainly also, uh, uh, yeah, opportunities, and to find I think also not to forget about the beauty I said in the beginning. So to find to explore kind of a new sustainable beauty, put it like that, where we care about everything, like. Je poserai ma question en français. Oui. Vous êtes un grand bureau. Merci pour votre présentation, c'était magnifique. Vous êtes un grand bureau. Vous êtes très impliqué, vous nous l'avez démontré. Malheureusement, quand on parcourt la Suisse, la France et partout ailleurs, on voit encore beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup de constructions très traditionnelles et qui ne tiennent pas du tout, euh, euh, qui ne tiennent pas compte du tout, justement, de vos préoccupations. Est-ce qu'au niveau de la profession, Il y a des incitations, ou au niveau des autorités, des incitations à construire plus soutenable Ou est-ce qu'il faut attendre une nouvelle génération d'architectes pour que partout dans le monde, un peu plus dans le monde, on va dire, des constructions qui prennent en considération tous ces éléments soient, soient effectivement prises en compte Parce que je trouve un peu dommage toutes ces, toutes ces constructions qu'on voit partout, euh, que ce soit des maisons individuelles, que ce soit des bâtiments euh, collectifs, c'est souvent très banal ouais. euh, et, et ça ne prend pas en compte du tout ces préoccupations. Comment vous voyez les choses Well, I would agree that too many ugly things are built, and you know, also not all our projects are super successful. But uh, we also have to be critical about that. But in general. I think it's important in education that people learn about beauty, not only architects, that you care about it, that you're also willing to pay a bit more. 
Um, it's also about how you pay an architect. In France, they're very, they're paid much uh, less than they're paid in Switzerland. So you can also take more time to think about a project, which is also important. Also good education, good craftsmanship, I think is important. Maybe also to build less, not so fast, and to build at the right place. There's too many things built just in the landscape. That's what I said in the beginning. I think we have to take care of, of, um, of the landscape, to look at the non-build also. I think we, Pierre Dumont, going to talk about uh, the project in Sion in a month, uh, the master plan we did for Sion, um, which is a project that goes in this direction, densifying, basically in the valley, not to build everywhere up the hill, but same time it's also there creating a beautiful public space, a green space in the middle. <coughs> so um, not just to think about your own building, but to think about the whole city, ideally. Merci pour votre présentation très intéressante. Euh, J'ai une question par rapport à la crise que nous venons de vivre. N'a-t-elle pas fait changer un peu les mentalités euh, que les gens vont plus aller vers des choses plus en campagne un changement de ville à campagne. Et deuxièmement, aussi dans ce changement de mentalité vers une nouvelle société, l'idée que les choses doivent être plus durables et plus euh, locales ne va-t-elle pas influencer toute votre architecture Merci. Euh, je ne suis pas sûr je <coughs> que je comprends tout. <rire> euh The first question, I think, was, if I understood correctly, was about living in the city or in the countryside. Huh? With that change, with, with that all change. the change that yeah. we had of society, yes. uh, yeah, uh, yeah. is there any change on your, it's, is there any impact in your, on your work? You have, do you have any impact with all the men, this mentalities, with the change of mentalities? A second question is how to move. Is, is, uh, 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 if, uh, if we have a new generation who will move from the city to the uh, mountains or the, cam uh, the, the countries? Um, yeah, I think it's a good question. Like before Corona, a lot of young people moved into the city. And because it's interesting also even for all the people to live in the city, you have everything in the city. And if you live in the city or in concentrated area, you don't um, commute so often. So it has a positive impact. Or at least live close where you work. But then Corona time, we all um, discovered how beautiful it is to live on the countryside, to go in the gr and it is possible now not to live or to work at home. Um, you don't need to, maybe many people don't need to be 100% in the office uh, f five days a week. So there's a way back to the countryside now or in during this corona time. Um, I don't know what is the best mix. <laughs> mm. um, uh, but I think maybe we have to learn to live with uh, less space again. Um, I see with myself it's difficult and you you get adopted to a certain lifestyle and then you, you don't want to go back and live in a smaller apartment. Um, but maybe for the next generation, if there are more and more people on the world, even in Switzerland, um, it's maybe the way to go, like in Asia, that we learn to live with li less space but more quality space. Does it have any impact on your work? Is it was the second part of the question. Yeah, we're also thinking now about uh, the virtual world because that is a, maybe it's a bit too futuristic, but um, many young people believe in that, that you don't need maybe so much physical space, you can have this virtual space, you can have your virtual reality, mm. um, your virtual uh, escape space somewhere else, which is then very maybe affordable for everyone. But um, I personally also believe very much in the physical, in the beauty of things you touch, the haptical thing. Um, 
And I see with my son, I'm not so happy if he's too much in the virtual world. <laughs> um, yes, I think quality matters, how things are detailed, they are detailed with, uh, with love. It's in also in these corona times, we have, when we were at home, we, you realize how important it is maybe that your flat has a, a balcony, that the light comes in from a nice way. You start to appreciate little things again instead of chatting somewhere all the, all the time, uh, every weekend somewhere, you can find a nice place, make it a nice place at home too. Your name and we wow, have okay. Merci. Merci. Mr. Marbach, thank you very much. Thank you everybody.